Great. We can. Thank you, David. Okay. Um, so this content is all uh, Creative Commons licensed, and so uh, it's available. And um, I'm used to posting the uh, video. If those, if if you don't want your face seen or your name shown, then um, you should uh, hide your video. Um, so this talk um, is a practitioner-oriented talk. There's multiple talks. Uh, there's a lot coming out recently, as I'll, I'll tell you, from the System Changes Learning Circle in Toronto. Um, so I'm one of uh, four people in the core group. Uh, I actually see Zad Khan, uh, my partner, and uh, is also online for this. So maybe I'll give him the hard questions. And we're <laughs> affiliated with um, Creative Systemic Research Platform Institute, which is incorporated in uh, Ticino, Switzerland. Uh, runs in Spain and Finland, um, and uh, Susan Nosala runs that. So um, if people are interested in following up um, and don't want to cross the Atlantic, then there may be opportunities to do that. So the agenda I'm going to cover today is um, what if systems changes aren't unfreeze, move, refreeze? Because that's kind of a presumption that comes in with most organizational change and, uh, and the way that people think about change. Uh, I'm going to talk about doing, and in that I'm going to cover actually an engagement that we've done for the Canadian Digital Service uh, through Code for Canada, and all that content is also um, Creative Commons licensed. And so um, it's uh, our first workshop. It's early in doing this, uh, but uh, it's uh, it's open for people who want to use it. Uh, we'll then talk very briefly about thinking, which is the action learning for facilitators, and we'll talk about making. Uh, which are the systematic methods that we're doing via multi-paradigm inquiry. Uh, and then if you want to join us, uh, we have, uh, we're have we still, still operating very much online. We started off in person, uh, but there's opportunities for co-learning on our 10-year journey. And so we are in year four of a 10-year journey. Um, this started actually in, 19, uh, in, in 2018, 2019, uh, when there was meetings rising on systems changes. Uh, and so for those of us who are in the systems thinking community, the question about, well, okay, systems change, how is that different from a change? Uh, when is it not systems change? Is it plural or is it singular? And so if we look as example, uh, OECD Observatory of Public Sector in Innovation, they say that it's used rarely and they were trying to get better at it. Uh, Stanford Social Innovation Review uh, is very focused on solving root causes, and that's the way they look at it. United Nations Development Program, three-phase three, three methodology, so they're actually trying to prescribe something. The one that set us off on this journey was actually the Forum for the Future McConnell Foundation. Uh, Benjamin Taylor uh, alerted me to this when he uh, sent me a note on Friday afternoon and says, coming to Toronto, want to have lunch on Monday. And it's like, what? You couldn't plan ahead, but um, why are you coming? And so uh, Benjamin was actually at this meeting on system changes. Um, and uh, the interesting um, thing, uh, the question I asked Benjamin and Peter Jones, who were attending this meeting, were uh, just do me one favor. When they talk about systems change, do they know what systems thinking or system science or anything systems is about? And uh, they came back and said, no, not really. Um, and the report is available. Um, and what they actually say is, we're going to do field building. We're not going to do definition work. And it's like, OK, well, that's interesting. Um, I understand the field building, but if you haven't decided what the field is, um, there's a little bit of a challenge there. Change as three steps has been attributed to Kurt Lewin. Unfreeze, change, refreeze. Um, this is an interesting article. There's also a YouTube video, if you'd like to watch it that way, on how Lewin never rewrote refreezing anywhere. And so uh, what happens when we don't assume that. Actually, if you look at, at Lewin's original writing, he uses uh, this idea of a river. And so he doesn't say to unfreeze the river and refreeze the river. So why are all these people taking this as an objective, self-evident truth that this is the way you should be doing change? We also have Henry Mintzberg, and people may have seen this chart before, where if you look at what happens in strategy, you've got to realize strategy that comes from uh, an intended strategy, which turns out to be deliberate, but then there's parts that don't work and don't happen. They've also got an emergent strategy of things that actually happen along the way. So things are not always as people intend. And when you're doing organizational change or strategy work, it's like there's a lot going on there. So we're, as I was saying, uh, we are uh, the System Changes Learning Circle in Toronto. Um, 
in uh, 2019, I invited a small, I invited a group, had a call. Uh, we had three other people who had said they would actually um, be interested in meeting for 10 years at the rate of at least every once every three weeks. And uh, at year four, we actually have a lot of content that come out. So in May of this year, on the left, System Thinking Through Changes this is an action learning guide for the Canadian Digital Service that's available online. Um, that was an interesting test for us because uh, when we first started off and trying to understand systems change, we were all over the place. Um, we actually document being all over the place, and you can follow along if you want to look back to the 2019 content and, and see where we were. Um, and then we converged and we actually said, okay, the test will be, will the ideas that we present be understandable by practitioners? And the interesting change that we have is that uh, this workshop was actually uh, requested by Code for Canada as a systems thinking workshop. And we said, fine, well, we're system thinking through changes. And so our emphasis is actually on the changes part and we back into the systems. But the way that people normally approach systems thinking, which is, oh, the first thing we need to do is define the system and then define the boundaries and what's the environment, we don't do that. So we're quite a bit different. Um, on the website is a Journal of Sustainable Smart Behavior paper. It's quite long. This is the action learning guide um, and the progress that we've made over the four years. Um, it's uh, it been accepted for publication. Uh, the reason the issue has not been come has not officially come out is one of the authors in the issue has COVID, and so that's held it up. But it has been officially accepted, and uh, it's available on uh, as on my site as a a personal uh, preprint. Um, the last presentation uh, on the right, um, appreciate, appreciating systems changes, um, is one that I gave on Friday, actually, uh, with the ISSS. And this one is the more theoretical, uh, methodological paper um, about going through multi-paradigm inquiry. Uh, it is not what the practitioners would really care about. Um, but in the system science community, um, they're interested in what's behind and what's under the hood. So. Um, that's available, um, and the video of that should come out in a couple of weeks, I would hope. Um, so if, when we talk about doing, thinking, and making, there's not a direct mapping here, but in effect, the, the first, the first uh, reference uh, to the Canadian Digital Service is pretty well all doing. Uh, it's all practice-oriented. We do this, we step you through a workshop, and what I'm going to do is give you a taste of some of that, and that's what, what follows in most of the presentation. The second one in the middle, the thinking paper, is um, is action learning and how you would do action learning. And there's different levels. And that's part of the challenge when we start talking about this, because there's a lot wrapped up, we, we, particularly when we start getting into the philosophical foundations of classical Chinese medicine. Um, is, is question is, you know, are you really serious about yin yang? Do you know what you're talking about? Or are you just blowing smoke? And it's like, no, we're actually pretty serious about this. Um, and the third one is a methodology, which is still under development. That'll be in the uh, years five through 10 of, as we continue our journey. So what uh, the, the, what is it that we're actually doing and how do we express this? So trying to be rigorous about this, we use object process methodology to make sure that we're getting things right. Um, system changes learning is an instance of, uh, of um, triggering conversation is an instance of systems changes learning. So we come into organizations and each one will learn in a different way. And when I'm saying learning, I'm using the Batesonian sense of it, which means that it's not just cognitive, it's how a, how a living being would learn and change associated with that. When we're looking at doing, thinking and making, what we're doing with doing is progressing practices. Um, and that is uh, one of the three orientations. On our, on our core team, we actually have, um, uh, Dan and Kelly, who are practitioners, and they actually are not much of academics. And so we've had the interesting uh, proposition of coming and presenting content to them and say, do you understand this? And they go, no, we don't understand. It's like, well, then as theoreticians, we've actually got it wrong because we can't explain it to you and you don't understand it. Then we're not doing our job well. The progressing theories happen at the same time. The progressing methods will happen as we get more experience and uh, working uh, with clients. So let's talk about the doing, which is uh, uh, the actual workshop that we did for Canadian practice uh, can, for the Canadian Digital Service. Here's a session agenda. Um, so we had a one-hour presentation. 
um, or we, we did the welcome, and then we introduced this idea of action learning practices as a hub and four spokes. Uh, we actually broke for lunch. Uh, we came back as a group, and we create we had workbook. And so the quest, and so what they would do online was actually work through the wor workbook on each of these topics. Had a coffee break, came back, and had um, more working through the workbook, uh, reflected on their practice, and then came and did some readouts. Um, so we could uh, see what they were doing, so they could share how far they had gotten or what how they or how they were doing on the content. Um, we requested a post workshop retrospective, some homework, uh, one page summary of past procedures not taken. Uh, we haven't actually got that back yet, um, but that's part of the learning process is actually trying to write and um, and document how far you've made or what progress you've made. So since it was a system thinking workshop, and these were not system thinking people, um, what we were trying to um, ensure, assure people is that we're not gonna teach you all of systems thinking. And so on the left side with the brown area um, are, the, are the clusters from uh, Magnus Ramis and Karen Shipp's book um, on systems thinkers. And these are the categories that they have. Of the categories that they have, we like, general systems theory, soft and critical systems, and learning systems. That's kind of the areas that we focus on. On top of that, we've added on some new areas, ecological anthropology. Um, we added on philosophy of science from a post-colonial and a, a Chinese philosophy of science standpoint, uh, service systems, systemic design, and practice theory. So we have uh, and recognize a lot of the original uh, legacy content, and we're also trying to push the system sciences forward. Now, Russ Acoff says, when you're thinking about authentic system thinking, synthesis precedes analysis. When you're saying thinking synthetically, you're placing parts into holes. When you're thinking analytically, you're loosing the holes into parts, taking things apart, putting things together, taking things apart, which is pretty simple. Now, the spin that we have at the bottom is that system changes learning when you're doing this adds thinking dyadically over time. Um, and so think about a tree and the tree goes through day and night. It goes with the sun coming up and the sun going down. Now, this is actually a dyadic process. It's not like the sun, just, sun doesn't exist. The sun rises and it goes down. You have um, at, the, uh, at noon, you've got maximum yang, as they say. Uh, and at midnight, you have maximum yin. So there's this distinction that goes on. And, and so... We, we, there is a, a distinction that we have that it's dualistic, not um, not dialectical. Now, that's enough. Did people trust us on this? It's like, okay, that's what as much of the technical stuff we're going to go through. Uh, what our emphasis is on system changes is, as opposed to just looking at a system statically and saying, what is a system? Our question is, what rhythmic shifts are present to you? And this comes from a premise that uh, we had in the beginning of the project when we started thinking about, well, why are people interested in systems change? Well, the way we would say it is people really don't get interested in systems thinking to the extent the system is changing. If the system isn't changing, it's like, well, why bother studying it? It could be an academic interest. But in effect, what happens is that we need to move from this idea where it's a no change state to something that changes and you go to a no change state again. Um, into a processual view. But when you have processes, then you have the idea, everyone, people say, oh, things are changing all the time. Well, that doesn't mean that some things don't change more than other and they're noticeable. So what we're asking is, what is the big shift that happens? And what we have here is multiple lines, as uh, Tim Ingold would call them. They're actually uh, wrapped in together uh, and they go into what we call a texture or a weave um, and what we're looking for is where things bunch up, where things cross over, and how those lines intersect or don't intersect with each other. Now we're looking at, at living systems. Um, and so we actually have the dyad at the bottom, but it could be a sax player if you like uh, as a musician. Um, and then uh, the dyad fits into the texture, which we had shown you before. So um, the texture could be a group of musicians. And so since it's it's part of it, then we call it contexture. Uh, most people use the word context and they get confused because when you think about context, they often think it's about text. Context is not about text, it's about texture. 
And so to be clear about this, we actually use the word contexture. Um, if people you want to use the word context, it's fine, but uh, we understand it, that it's like this weaving that happens over time. The way we think about change is uh, mechanisms have causality and conditions and living systems have propensity and conditions. And the way of expressing that would be thinking about, as an example, motorboat towing, um, where you're, you're going water skiing. And so in this case, man has control ever, over everything. You get into the boat, uh, you put out all the lines and the uh, water skier gets dragged behind you. They have control of pretty well most everything. Uh, they try to avoid, they can steer around the big waves to stay around the rocks. rocks. Um, we can compare that to the idea of propensity uh, in surfing. So surfing, the surfer does not control the wave. They pick when they're gonna go um, they pick where they're going to go, and when they get there, a lot of surfing is about sitting, waiting for the right wave to come. When the wave comes, you want it, it has a propensity, and it's like, okay, you want to ride that wave, but also you have to deal with the other people who are in the water, in the lineup, who are there along with you. And there's protocols associated with that, and there's uh, uh, if you take someone else's wave, it's considered rude. So there, but. The idea of propensity is, is one in which we we not looking so much goal-oriented, we're looking for the right conditions to arise. And so we've all had these situations where someone does the right thing at the wrong time. Well, what we'd say is maybe you should think about doing uh, timing what you're doing and doing things at the right time. You don't want to be pushing a rock uphill. So the hub with four spokes is how we actually express and work through the uh, the workbook. Um, the first premise is we start from knowing from within. And knowing from within says that system change only happens from inside the system. People can criticize from outside the system, but really the system itself has to want to change. And so my running joke, for those who met me, I'm a little overweight. I would like to lose weight. Uh, people telling me that I need to lose weight, um, that it, that's informational. It doesn't really motivate me to necessarily change and go on my diet. I go on my diet when I decide I'm going to do that. It doesn't mean that I don't know how to diet. It doesn't mean, it mean that I'm not motivated to do it. But timing is important to me because uh, if I go on a diet, I'll be crabby. So I um, can't get much work done. Uh, from there, we go north, uh, recognizing contextual influences. What's happening outside the system that is influencing the system? So as I was saying, um, I do the cooking and I, I traditionally have done the cooking in the family. Um, and so um, now we're actually empty nest again. Uh, the contextual influence is that if I do the shopping and the grocery shopping and I'm doing the cooking, then I actually can control my own weight because I don't know how to do that. Um, going to the east, we take a medical metaphor. And this is intervening in a system that you would actually know. Uh, diagnosing the rhythmic disorders. Uh, what is happening in the system? Now, it could be that a person actually knows what's happening within the system himself or herself, but they may require help or someone outside to give them advice. Um, and the diagnosis can be detailed or it could be a simple one. From there, you go to prognosing likelihoods because usually there's more than one treatment available. And so the question is, which treatment would you like? Um, and the treatment actually gets involved with the context uh, because uh, if you're going on a diet by yourself, you live by yourself, then there's not much going to happen. If you're cooking for a family, um, then all of a sudden it gets complicated um, and your work schedules and these sort of things get in the way. Uh, to the nine o'clock position uh, is where we get into action, reordering pacing. And what we're trying to do now is that since we've seen the rhythmic disorder, the question would be, well, how would you actually uh, make those changes? But the changes may require, if you're in a layered context uh, perspective, um, then you would actually, uh, uh, if, uh, then you may not be able to change within the next, within the layer, you'd have to go to the next layer. Or if you uh, make one a change that is not uh, persistent, but is temporary, then you could go to a smaller and faster system. But you end up thinking about the constraints on the upper and lower bounds of what the system that's containing you or the containing systems. Uh, again, the legend on the uh, for object, uh, using object process methodology. So this is uh, some are informational, some are um, are physical, and some the origin is from the system, the others are origins from the environment. So that's just being, uh, again, more rigorous for us. 
So that's actually the uh, amount of presentation. That's a highlight from the presentation we actually gave uh, uh, for Canadian Digital Service. Uh, and then came back after lunch. And so these are, this is what we had. And if you go to the website, you can actually get the full slide deck. And we had these guiding questions. And so, um, and we actually set up then a, um, a, a document uh, and people can fill in the blanks. And so the guiding question is, well, what rhythmic shift is or, is or are most present to you? Um, from that, then which is your system of interest? And the system of interest can and should know, and it can adapt or learn. Um, so the assumption is a living system of some sort. And then uh, we had the description of dyadic processes. Uh, because uh, one of the interesting problems with going and taking the idea of synthesis and then analysis is when you go down to the next level and you're actually uh, taking things apart, um, people go a little overboard and they go into the parts that actually don't get reassembled together. And so we're using actually the, uh, uh, the Chinese philosophy of yin and yang because you need things that are working together. And I'll explain a little bit of that. Uh, I'll give a little bit of a hint later. Um, but... The idea here, here's first example, consider a shift of the pandemic where you're working from home and how that impacts family life, which rhythmic shift is most present to you? Okay, well, depending on your living situation, you people are living in, live in closer quarters. Uh, if you're in a very small apartment, that's not gonna be good. Uh, are the conveniences easy to you? Can you actually plan ahead to go to grocery stores because they're closed? So what's the system of interest? Uh, we'll say it's a household. And which di two dyadic processes carry on synthesizing? We have working, uh, providing income, and we call it domesticizing, uh, homemaking. And so you can't work all the time. Um, you can't also keep house all the time. It's a combination of the two things that keep you going. Uh, if we look at an example, we're looking at building a software app for a uh, venue vaccination tracking. What rhythmic shifting shifts are, are more present for you? Um, so. Uh, Visitors to a website or an app that you previously had done anonymously, uh, you, that's a shift to track them now um, and uh, requires more security. It requires a lot of privacy considerations. Um, there was an app in Canada where, uh, actually in Belgium, it was much better. You could just bring up your phone, they would scan the phone, um, but then you need the technology, the venue, the restaurant would have to actually do that checking. Um, the system of interest um, in Toronto, we have a group called Civic Tech. They're a volunteer technical organization, and uh, they might be the ones that would take this on. And then which two dyadic processes would you have? Uh, privileging the access to personal records, which you give for a certain period of time with the right to be forgotten. And so you have that balance between actually giving information and, and um, your privacy that have to go on simultaneously. So here's the hint on, and, th and this is where the facilitators need to know a little bit more than the uh, people who are actually participating in the workshop, um, is what is yin and yang. And so yang is generally the light side and yin is the dark side. Um, and the interesting things that, um, the interesting pairs that come out, um, number five in the list is dissipating and materializing. So yang is more like air and yin is more like soil. Um, and so um, among the facilitators, we end up getting familiar with what is yang and yin. Uh, for those who are actually born in China, which I'm not, I'm Canadian born, uh, I am Chinese heritage. Um, so uh, I actually never quite understood why my grandmother would say things were pretty obvious. Like, so why is brandy warming and scotch cooling? And she says, well, it's obvious. And you kind of go, I have no idea why it's obvious, but these are obvious in the Chinese philosophy. And so um, we can learn a little bit from that. Now we're actually looking at diagnostic rhythmic disorders. And this is again, excerpt. If you look in the middle, you normally have yin and yang and it runs within a normal range. And so they kind of overlap each other. Um, but you get into one of four conditions. One is excess yang, which means you're running too hot. Um, and uh, you can run hot for a while, and then what happens is actually you, you go south from there, and you actually have consumed yin, so you're out of balance, but what happens, your energies burn through itself, and you've got the other situation, so the question we can actually ask, uh, and they, the uh, participants actually understood this, you know, uh, what are you running too hot, and they're talking about development, uh, software development, 
Uh, in the case of software development, so are you developing or are you maintaining? Because you have to do both. And they said, oh, no, our development is fine, but our maintenance is so far behind, it's killing us. And so that would be uh, uh, one of the imbalances that we could discuss and work through. Now, when we recognize the contextual influences, there's a lot happening. And uh, people have found this helpful, uh, a separation between um, events or uh, concerns that are local versus distant or urgent and important. And what happens is that quite often people focus on the local and urgent. But what we should say is that you should also remember that there are things that are distant and important. And if you don't take care of them, then they end up coming in and becoming local and urgent. Um, so uh, there's probably a balance. Uh, here we've got, a, uh, again, a medical metaphor. Are you on the battlefield where you think that you need to uh, stabilize someone so they can actually survive? Or is it a, um, a neighborhood clinic that you could just uh, schedule something? Or do you need to go to an operating room where everything has to be in place and they wheel you in? So there's all these different conditions of ways of, uh, of looking at the context. Um, this is at the end of the workshop uh, because they would have had uh, pages uh, and questions for each one of the uh, the four. But the guiding questions we asked: What did you collectively learn during the workshop? What more do you need to learn? Which options do you choose? Which path do you disfavor, and why? And which actions are next? So, for those of you who are doing action research, action learning projects, these are definitely trying to encourage people uh, towards the learning process. Okay, thinking. Um, this is the presentation from the ISSS. I'll leave it mostly, uh, uh, sorry, this is actually the, the research paper that's published. Um, and the way we looked at this is praxis doing uh, theory and making. Um, and we have it in different categories. So the question is, how would you learn to be a practitioner of system changes learning? And so the first thing would be educating of attention. So is it a behavioral view you're looking at, which is inside the organization going out? or is it ecological, which is outside the organization coming back in. And for that, we, uh, we generally have helped people through that because they don't understand the word ecological, but it's from the outside in perspective. Um, are the attention towards changelessness or temporality? Um, do you think that things are gonna be the same or are you in a, a world where things are changing all the time? And when you're actually approaching it, are you actually looking for direct uh, causality, or are you going to take an approach that takes into account propensity? And these things go into, that's the first level. Uh, when we get to the second level, facilitators should probably have the, uh, the understanding of how you do learning for correlating things. And then there's a refinement with learning for uh, articulating as we formalize the processes. So just to give you a flavor of some of the content, uh, behavioral psychology asks what's inside your head Whereas ecological approach asks, what's your head inside of? Um, this goes back to be the uh, 1950s, behavioral psychology, and if you've got Pavlov's dog, if you want to figure out why the dog is salivating, you're looking inside the dog's head. J.J. Um, Gibson brought the idea of an ecological approach to perception. Um, he was actually studying pilots landing aircraft on uh, ships. Uh, in the Navy. And in that case, you've got the uh, aircraft moving, you've got the ship moving, and actually understanding what's going on in the pilot's head actually is not very helpful. You need to understand what's happening outside uh, on the ship, whether you can land or not land and how far away you are from it. So things are constantly moving. There are two ways of seeing this, um, uh, uh, seeing nature, and uh, this goes back to the Greeks. Uh, we have reality as a changeless state with Parmenides and reality as a, uh, change, a state of change with Heraclitus. Um, when we go over to Chinese philosophy, it kind of removes this because we're purely in a processual approach. Uh, it's more like the right side. Uh, for those who want some discussion, um, we could talk about how, uh, uh, why we settled on rhythms because um, when you're in a process, it not ne it's not necessarily a rhythmic process that cycles over and over again, but it's in the right direction. Uh, we have the idea of Wei and Wu Wei, willful action and non-obtrusive action. And the question is, should you act at all or should you let nature take its course? Um, and so uh, this is related to the propensity we're talking about. Sometimes we're better to wait if you're doing uh, Sun Tzu, where the propensity idea comes from, uh, you have the enemy come to you or come to you at an unfavorable time, um, you can do that. So making, 
um, this multi-paradigm approach. I'm going to summarize this briefly um, because uh, the, you'll probably be, uh, watch the video in a couple of weeks. Uh, the way we approached um, looking at this is I have multiple philosophies and we're approaching them each in different ways. Uh, the philosophy of architectural design is actually uh, Christopher Alexander's pattern language. The philosophy of ecological anthropology comes from Tim Ingold. Philosophy of classical Chinese medicine comes from Keacock Lee. Um, there's a weakness in the philosophy of rhythms. Um, there's not much actually written. And from that, we actually advance into, uh, I propose a philosophy of systems rhythms. And the way we evaluate them is actually through the judgments of, of um, uh, Jeffrey Vickers, Sir Jeffrey Vickers, uh, appreciative systems. So what's real? Um, what's of value and what's as instrumental judgment, how do you get things done? So if we're talking about Christopher Alexander, who's building um, buildings, built environments, what he's actually doing is differentiating space. That, that's the reality. Uh, the value judgment is he's trying to produce a living order uh, in the early books called that quality without a name. And the way he does that is through unfolding patterns, uh, constructing, repairing, and the idea of systems generating systems. And the system generating systems is interesting because it's um, it is uh, he's building houses, but you're looking for beauty in the city or town, and so you're trying to get sy the system, which is the uh, the building generating in, at a different scale. In ecological anthropology, what's real there? Lines is becoming and mesh works, and so uh, Tim Ingold writes a lot about lines as opposed to points. Uh, the value judgments we have attending what we pay attention to um, alongside other beings, and then the way that we engage is by corresponding um, with other beings uh, through agency and uh, attention. Um, what's the reality in philosophy, philosophy of classical Chinese medicine? Diseases are internal. Um, uh, the Chinese doctor I've been seeing for 30 years actually uh, published a book, and it's called uh, Internal Chinese Medicine. And I asked, is there such a thing as external Chinese medicine? And he looked at me very strange and said, there's no such thing as external Chinese medicine. Okay, so Chinese medicine is internal, but there are external causes, as they recognize, um, that uh, can have an influence on the system. The value judgment, way, way, whether you act or you don't act. The instrumental judgment is then working on the yin or yang. If it's external, then you have the pathogenic factors outside. So the proposal that we have for the philosophy of system rhythms is uh, that we should focus on rhythmic shifts in textures. Um, so when people think about change, it's like, well, let's just talk about the change. Let's talk about the rhythms and how the rhythms shift and the rhythms are wrapped up in this weave or this texture. Uh, the value judgment is about propensity and the instrumental judgment will be about reordering pacing, whether it's actually possible to change um, and, uh, and whether you do it at a slower, bigger level or a faster, um, smaller level. A um, little more on Alexander. Um, Alexander and Horst Riddle and Wes Churchman were all at um, Berkeley at the same time. So um, what I've been doing over time to learn about um, the thinking, well, I've, I've been actually chasing the grad students who are actually now uh, mostly retired. Um, but um, learning from that, um, we discover a lot about the way that uh, they think about timeless way of building as an example. Uh, Tim Ingold actually extends the work of Gregory, Gregory Bateson. Gregory Bateson in Steps to an Ecology of Mind said the mental world is not limited to the skin. You have the ecology of life where you have this organization plus environment. And so the whole organization and environment and asking the question of what is your system of interest and drawing a boundary around it um, is actually systems people maybe misapplying the theory. Uh, it, if we think about organisms over time and we think about generations of people, we may be in a different uh, frame, different mindset. Um, the, this book by Keacock Lee, um, Benjamin Taylor has a recording of her that I'd love that he, if he would release that, um, is, is the um, most significant work that I've seen in uh, quite a few years. And uh, the problem is trying to explain classical Chinese medicine to someone that's Western. And she goes down to the philosophical level uh, the dualistic approach, which is abstract and permanent, independent of context, and you create propositions, extrapolate from that. Um, in the Chinese philosophy, the application and meaning are relative to everything. It's only in a context, and you can only evaluate the assertion within that context. So when you're looking at pairing, most of what people think is yin and yang is actually du dualistic. It is not dyadic. So superior, inferior, like in effect, you've got one that is better, you know, in effect, this would be saying like white is better than black. 
But in the Chinese sense, it's well, white only makes sense in the, in the sense of black. And so um, the way that Keycock expresses it, and when you, when you say a cat, a cat, uh, and you're trying to create categories, when you say it's not a cat, you're probably not talking about everything in the world. You have this context, which is you may be talking about animals, you may be talking about what's in your house, but there's a context there. Um, and the idea of men or women as superior, that actually depends on which context. Um, so um, women are better at some things in certain contexts, and we can describe those contexts. But the frames are, you change from the hierarchical to the yin yang, you change from being reductionist to being a harmonious whole. Um, and then you have the philo philosophical entity or thing ontology that changes into mutually engendering or constraining. So it takes a shift. Um, and within the system changes team, people are getting comfortable. Uh, the core members are getting comfortable. New people always uh, have a little bit of trouble getting over that curve. We start talking about rhythms. It's not just a single rhythm. It's multiple rhythms that are blended together. Uh, technical term is polyrhythmia. Uh, isorhythmia actually pretty rarely exists uh, in music and symphonic music. They have it. Um, so usually we're talking about either eurythmia or arrhythmia. If you had eurythmia in your living body, things are fine. You're not going to go see a doctor. Uh, when you are going to see someone is when you have an arrhythmia, and that's a breaking apart of the rhythms, um, and that is disease and and all the sorts of things that you want fixed. And so. Um, the, the ideas more generally, uh, Henri Lefebvre was not writing about medicine. He was writing about a philosophy, a way of looking actually at people in the, on the street um, and how they uh, move and, and those things together. Okay, just to close out. Um, so the System Changes Learning Circle is centered in Toronto. Uh, we originate from the Center for Social Innovation um, at OCAD University. There's a strategic foresight and innovation program. And we run uh, monthly System Thinking Ontario meetings. If people would like to join us, we're still online. We'll see if we go um, back to um, in-person uh, shortly. Um, but uh, there's me, Dan, Kelly, and Zad. And you can reach out to us. Uh, for those who are interested in actually meeting online, we actually uh, have been open with all of our content from the very beginning. Um, Robert Best has been good for hosting us on the Open Learning Commons. Um, that's actually a discourse board. You can go sign up there. It's email uh, driven, or you can do the online forums. Um, for the chat, we actually have um, Mattermost, which is an open source Slack. It's provided by the Digital, um, Digital Life Collective. Uh, the rules there are actually, those are also um, uh, uh, conversations that are considered to be Creative Commons licensed. Uh, we have the little speed bump, though, that you have to pay the $10 to join the uh, Digital Life Collective. So that's enough to deter most people. And of course, the web doesn't index these things. So the private, the, the early conversations tend to happen in the matter most, and then we drive people out into the Open Learning Commons for everything we can uh, and make it public. Uh, the Creative Systemic Research Platform Institute uh, was founded in 2017. I've been working with uh, Susu Nosala for some years, um, and uh, Susu and uh, Yelena have incorporated in uh, Switzerland, so it's actually an entity now. Um, we had the first annual meeting uh, last November in Brussels, and uh, uh, we're collaborating together. Um, it's good to have uh, people on different continents because it just makes the time zone so much easier. So that's covered pretty well everything. And um, I'll be interested if people would like to have questions and I'll be happy to answer. Thanks. Thank you, David. Do we have any immediate questions, folks? That'd be great to. Patrick, I see your hand raised. David, th thanks for that. Um, I've, got a, I've got a sort of um, slightly tricky question, I guess. So when you were talking about the rhythms bit and the yin yang and too hot and, and, and that slide, um, mm -hmm. the thing that it, it, it that resonated with me um, really closely was was the work that we do on on uh, complexity balances or variety balances, a la Ashby. Mm. And I mean, there's obvi an obvious connection between the two because obviously rhythm is, you know, the rate at which change is happening which is which is which is clearly one aspect of, of, of variety and the, 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 the other connection that well the, the other parallel i think is the is the slipperiness of this as as a a thing to to kind of wrap your arms around so two-part question really one is 
is that is that connection that I'm seeing um, in your mind, or is that just just, just some you know so, so, some nonsense I've dreamt up? And the second part is how because this is the thing that one of the things that that's kind of um, most difficult to do practically. I mean, the toolings our tooling is rubbish for this. Um, how how easy have you found this as a practical tool for people to get a, a handle on the the sorts of things we're talking about? Does the question makes or the two questions make sense? Yes. Okay. So the, for for the first question, um, I will say no. When we moved over to Chinese philosophy um, and digging down through Keacock Lee, it's kind of like no. Um, mm -hmm. The distinction between dyadic and uh, dualistic is really really big. And so, um, and, and kind of express that with, uh, if, if you say cat and not cat, um, the not cat is not the whole universe. Hmm. Um, it's so, it's so when the sun goes down, it's not like the sun doesn't exist. It's just in a cycle that's coming back. So there's um, a lot that uh, we're working through. Um, and, uh, and to answer your second question, um, the for the, for the participants doing a, the workshop, they didn't actually have a problem with this. Mm. Um, we're just talking, and, and so saying that we wanna focus on rhythms and, and rhythmic shifts um, was, I, don't, I would say that it may be easier than saying, I wanna ask you what a system is, because they go, well, what's a system, mm. right? You always get that question. And so we've, we've actually ducked that by not asking what, a, not, we don't bring up the word systems very much, but for the facilitators, uh, it creates that interesting uh, weight and load that they have to be pretty clear about um, mm -hmm. what they're doing. And that's not to say that we don't make our own mistakes, right? Mm -hmm. This is very, we're, we're in year four of a 10 year journey and we think it will take a while to get um, other people up the curve. Um, what we're uh, dealing with now is a, is a good problem to have, which is how do we uh, spread the knowledge? Mm -hmm. uh, because, and, and that's why the, the uh, the paper that's the Journal of, of, uh, of Smart, uh, Sustainable Smart Behavior is a long paper uh, because it actually goes into the nitty gritty and it says, oh no, we actually have been trying to do this um, cleanly so that the practices, theory and methods actually align to each other. Thank you. Any more questions, folks? You've stunned them all, David. <laughs> and there was a lot in the chat, David, you might want to have a look at. But if I remember rightly, you, you have a new, there's just a little a very academic question that came up. Am I right that you have a slightly particular nuanced view of action learning that doesn't quite shift, it quite trace back to Reg Revens, but is something slightly different? Or is that my imagination? Also, do no. you have a scooter behind you? <laughs> so quite, I'm in that's David. quite unusual. <laughs> that, that that is a, a Harvey Harley Davidson. <laughs> oh, I shouldn't have called it a scooter. Okay, I might follow. Yeah, yeah, scooter. that's a, yeah, that's a, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, so this is not Red Revens. This is actually uh, Eric Trist. And so, mm -hmm. um, uh, and actually, since I'm in David Hawk's house, um, David Hawk studied under um, under uh, Eric Trist. Um, at, 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 there's a long trail from the Tavistock Institute with, um, uh, with the uh, socio-technical systems, socio-ecological systems. Um, the socio-ecological systems, after Trist left uh, uh, Wharton and went through UCLA, he ended up at York University in Toronto. Uh, so we actually have a lot of the knowledge at York University, um, not, I would say, not so much at University of Toronto or at... Um, uh, or at uh, Ryerson or OCAD U even. Um, um, and so they're really the stronghold of that. Of that. Um, but the, so uh, it is not Rev Revens, uh, it is uh, contextual action learning, which is a phrase that you'd only have to do if you knew, uh, if you could make the separation between the socio-technical systems approach and the socio-ecological system approach. And, that, and that's where the ecological, uh, a, a lot of this has been uh, the result of work trying to figure out what people mean. Um, so uh, ecological means uh, outside in, uh, when you actually get down to, um, to the way that J.J. Gibson actually originally in, uh, used the term. Um, and so um, there's also uh, the, uh, the famous paper, Causal Textures of Organizational Environments, Emory and Trist, 1965. And uh, I have a long blog post on 
what the heck is a causal texture? <laughs> because it's like, <laughs> oh, so so it's like, yeah, I and so texture, that's how I figured out that texture and context. That's you know, that's why the wording makes a difference. Because in effect, um, I'm uh, we in the blog post that I have. Uh, if you search on causal texture and, and uh, you look on the co-evolving site, um, you'll find out that it goes back to C.S. Pepper. So it's 1934, I believe. Wow. And so Emery and Trist were reading Pepper and they're reading Tolman and Brunswick right before they got to uh, publishing the 1965 article. So what I've done um, and my contribution would be that by adding the rhythmic component to it, when we're talking about uh, change, I'm now getting people to focus on time again because you could talk about the change as a one 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 time thing and we really shouldn't be thinking about change that way. Mm -hmm. Could I add to what David said relative to contextual and texture, et cetera, that uh, relative to Eric Trist, uh, he made this important distinction, you know, assuming uh, somewhat in the Goffman terms that people are acting on a stage and during life, they perform as actors. So he made this distinction between the stage set and the actors. And he began to argue that with time, the uh, stage set or the background was becoming increasingly important to the play and the actor was becoming less and less important. And so that's how they wrote this article on the emergence of a, shall we say a turbulent environment as they called it. And that's where the, uh, context becomes quite crucial. The people acting out on it are become uh, <clears throat> perhaps less crucial. And at the time, as I talked to David about, at the time he also uh, proposed a vortex environment because he felt that turbulent was not the end state, but perhaps a vortex was more relevant. And Emory was quite upset about this and Emory would not accept that uh, that kind of environment, that humans will never see that. And so they left that out of their article. Later, Tris talked about it briefly, but didn't want to offend Emory. And so he didn't go there. But <laughs> in my uh, dissertation in the 70s, uh, <clears throat> I stumbled on the issue of, uh, let's see, what should we call it, climate change? And so I propose climate change as heading towards the vortex. And Tris liked that very, very, very much. And uh, he sort of never left liking that. And so we went a bit deeper relative to uh, uh, this contextual issue of the context in essence, replacing the actor, replacing people. And ultimately the uh, climate change conditions would more or less trivialize people. And so that gives you a little bit more of what David was leading up to and why such was very important to Trist and essentially no one else. Mm. That he was an odd character, an outlier. Uh, Akoff always had trouble with the turbulent. So once when I was being interviewed for a job by the head of the Stockholm School of Economics, uh, Akoff decided to come in and sit in on the interview, which was very sweet of him. And then in the middle of the interview, he said, David, could you please define turbulence for us? That do you know what it is or do you have to bring Trist into the setting and say, Eric, is this turbulent or not? And et cetera, et cetera. So Akoff was <clears throat> quite bothered about those environmental types. And I, well, as most of us now know, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> those environmental types are quite important and context has become terribly important <clears throat> and uh, is having an increasing impact on us. Sorry for mm. the throat. No, thank you, David. David, thank you for that. Um,